Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, Erica, uh, I'm delighted to be here with you all today. And I want to um, hopefully share some exciting new information uh, that some of your members may not be aware of that's really, really important in terms of, of how we look to improve care uh, in the United States. So uh, I, in, I titled the topic of my presentation, You Want Great Science, Then Embrace Diversity and Recognize Disparities. As way of uh, disclosures, I'm a consultant for Zimmer Biomet on musculoskeletal health disparities. I chair Movement is Life, which is a multi-stakeholder coalition of individuals committed to eliminating musculoskeletal disparities. And I'd like to ask the audience, particularly since you're a different audience than what I'm, what I'm used to, um, for us to have a contract here. I want to help you do great science, and I would like you to give me feedback. Here's how you reach me. This is my email address, mary.oconnor, my last name but without the apostrophe, at yale.edu. And some of the adult learning questions that I would ask you would be, what did you find most helpful about this presentation? What was most puzzling? And what surprised you the most? So I would love your feedback. You can give me answer any or all three of those questions, that would be fantastic. So I want to start with emphasizing that healthcare disparities are real. And we see huge differences in life expectancy in areas that are not that geographically apart, okay? So you can look at this area in Boston, and here we have a life expectancy of 91.9 years, and then if we go to this region, it's 58.9 years. So uh, that's a 33 year difference. I mean, that's astonishing. It's astonishing. I mean, how is that possible that we can have that? Racial and ethnic patients are hampered by poor musculoskeletal care, and this contributes to those life expectancy differences that we just saw. Hispanics are 50% more likely than non-white Hispanics to report needing assistance with at least one instrumental activity of daily living. Those are activities of daily living that really allow you to be independent and to have difficulty walking. And the CDC states in 2000, black Medicare enrollees were 37% less likely than whites to undergo total knee replacement, TKA, total knee arthroplasty. And that disparity increased to 29% in 2006. So these are just a couple snippets of facts and data about how real disparities are. I want to take a moment and talk about the epidemic uh, of obesity. And if you look, and there is just some new data that literally just came out a couple days ago from the CDC, and I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to put it in, but it just is the same story with, with even more startling statistics. So if you look at the prevalence of obesity in adults, and here's non-Hispanic whites, and you can see that there's a higher percentage, particularly in the heartland. But now look at that same data set for African Americans. And we see just a huge increase in rates of obesity for African Americans. Um, and, and this helps drive disparities and adverse outcomes. Now, here's Hispanic adults, not as significant as Black Americans, but basically when we look at the obesity ladder, we see whites, Hispanics, and Blacks, but there's, there's no good story here because the obesity rates among whites is also dramatically increasing. So, so so bad news all around. And then when you look at, this, at these lower figures, you can see how the rates of obesity have dramatically increased. Now, I wanna talk about why musculoskeletal health is so critical to this issue of obesity and poor health. And this is what we call our vicious cycle. It starts with joint pain, which leads to limited mobility, People then become less physically active. They gain weight because they eat the same. That puts more pressure on their joint, and they're in this cycle. 
this cycle of joint pain. And that cycle ultimately results in severe osteoarthritis. And that cycle can be broken by movement because we know movement is healthy for joints. Movement helps uh, keep your weight down. And we also know that associated with obesity and sedentary lifestyles are increased risks of heart disease, diabetes, depression, hypertension. So I see every day in my office patients coming in who have significant knee arthritis and who are poor surgical candidates because they're obese and they have lots of comorbid conditions. And we've seen the fact that we're in this horrible health situation with this rise of comorbid conditions in the population playing out in terms of death in the horrible pandemic that we're living in right now. So we need to fundamentally improve health in our communities and we need to break this vicious cycle. We need to get people moving more. Now, this vicious cycle is actually, I call it an equal opportunity employer, right? The affluent white male CEO can get trapped in this cycle just as the uh, low income woman of color. But women and individuals of color are so much more likely to get trapped in this vicious cycle. We know this from data. Now, why is this? Because around this vicious cycle is this green ring of social determinants of health. We see lower life expectancy. What I just showed you in terms of the uh, differences in terms of life expectancy based on where people live. We see inequitable care, lower quality of life, lots of social issues that impact that inner medical vicious cycle. And around this ring of social determinants, comes public and private policy. How do we create policy regarding health payments, health systems, community wellness, all impacts the social determinants, which then impact the medical vicious cycle. And now surrounding the public and private policy, I have a new ring that I've just added, which is pandemic. So here we've seen how essential workers, which tend to be in a lot of areas, um, underserved and lower income individuals who tend to have higher rates of obesity and comorbid conditions. And by the way, those higher rates of, of obesity and comorbid conditions are not limited to African Americans and, and Hispanics because we see these conditions in rural America affecting Caucasians as well. Common link is poverty or lower income. So this pandemic has taken 200,000 lives now, and we know that there is a disproportionate impact on individuals of color and individuals of lower socioeconomic stat standing. So fundamentally addressing disparities is essential if we're going to improve the health of the nation. And I hope that one thing the pandemic has taught us is that, you know, no one is an island. We are all connected. We are all part of the main to quote uh, John Doan. And, um, and, and we, we can't live in isolation from each other. So each of us should be invested in improving health in our communities. Now I wanna to turn to how we can do that in terms of our teams. And if there's one, one image I want you to remember from this presentation, it's this picture. So. This is my handsome son, my middle child, and there he is at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and he's standing in front of the Acura Legend car that I bought when he was literally nine months old. Okay, so this car is literally like 18 years old. And I bought this car because it was one of two cars on the market, and again, this is a long time ago, that had a passenger side airbag. Airbags were relatively new technology. Lots of cars had them on the driver's side, but very few had them on the passenger side. Mercedes and the Acura Legend uh, LS Trimline, which is what I bought because I was in debt. I had just started my job, uh, you know, finished my fellowship. Um, and so I couldn't afford the Mercedes. So I bought this car. And this car had a first generation airbag. 
And I bought this car simply for that safety feature because I felt it would protect my children. I had two children at the time. He was nine months old. Let's talk about airbags and great science. These first generation, the first generation of airbags was designed by a team that was predominantly male engineers, tested on the average passenger. Tragically, women, children, and small men were killed. So were the engineers incompetent? Your group of engineers, do you think they were incompetent? I don't think so. I think they were probably very well trained. I think that you know, Detroit invested millions in creating uh, this safety device, but it failed. What if this engineering team was predominantly women? Do we, let me go, do we think that, that there would have been women that would have said, what if my baby's in the passenger side? What if my child is sitting in the passenger side? Is this passenger side airbag safe for them? But that wasn't, that wasn't considered. The device was tested on the average passenger, which is a male, an adult male. Now we have broadened our scope of what that, of, of a passenger. But back then, no one thought to consider the impact of this device on someone that wasn't an adult male because it was adult males who were controlling the conversation, controlling the testing and the thought process. I think if there had been women on that engineering team, this tragedy would not have happened. Because we do not see things as they are. We see things as we are. We all carry into our teams our own perspective based on who we are, based on our gender, based on our race, ethnicity, based on whether we come from big families or small families, where we live, our education level, etc. So, High performing teams, that's what we're after because high performing teams will avoid the airbag tragedy. If we put exceedingly diverse professionals on the same team, we will produce the best results. And exceedingly diverse professionals doesn't mean, doesn't mean just people of different genders, race, ethnicities, although that is critically important, as I hope you appreciate from the airbag example, but it's also recognizing that people have different skills. And of course, within uh, gender, race, ethnicity, people have different skills, different backgrounds, and different approaches to problem solving. So what I want to take you through now is how you can be a better leader of your team. Because leaders tailor the commu their communication to the specific personality type of their team member to be more effective. And this is the work of Harvey Robbins, who is at the Carlson School of Business at the University of Minnesota, who's graciously allowed me to share this with you. And there are lots of ways that people look at personality styles, and you can do Myers-Briggs and all, all kinds of different things. I like Dr. Robbins' um, concepts because they're very easy for me to remember and for me to think of in an operational perspective. So, so he looks at, pe at four different personality styles, analytical, driver, amiable, and expressive. And it's important to know that all of us are, are, not, are typically not just one style. We may be very dominant in one style, but typically most people are a mixture of two or three maybe two that are stronger, and then the third and fourth are weaker. But each of us has some of this in us, but it varies in terms of, of, of how much we have. So I want to briefly go through each of these styles, and I think that you'll recognize yourself and some of your team members. Uh, and if we were in, together, we could do some you know, live interactive uh, work where I actually have people go into four corners of the room based on what they think their strong style is. And, and we, we role play a little bit and it's really quite fun. Okay, so if I was with you live, I would say, well, what style is this? And you, because you're all really smart people would say, that's a driver, very good. Okay, drivers are action oriented, let me do it people. They think in the present, they're very proactive. Erica's raising her hand. I can see her on my screen. She's a driver, okay? What is the great strength of drivers? 
they get results. They do the work. They get it done. Okay. What's the negatives? Other people can perceive drivers as being very pushy, dominating, and strong-willed because drivers are perceived as literally, it's my way or the highway. I'm driving, I'm moving, get out of my way. You're either with me or get out of my way. This type, this is the analytical. Analyticals are the perfectionists. They're data-driven. It's all about the data, 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 data. Now, engineering types, I'm making an assumption. Some of you are probably pretty strong analyticals because you deal with a lot of data and you, I'm making an assumption that most of you like data. Analyticals are patient and cautious. The negatives is that they can be seen as indecisive, picky and serious. And I'll give you an example, a couple examples. So one of my partners was a very, very strong analytical. And I, I didn't realize this at first, and I was running a, a department meeting, um, and I would get frustrated because I, I was in my driver mode, and I bring to the group, here's the agenda, here's the things that we need to decide, and we need to get it done in the meeting, right? Boom, boom, boom. Let's be efficient and get it done. And one of my partners, I could sense his resistance, and he would be asking questions, and kind of uncomfortable about making a decision then. And once I understood this framework, I realized that he fit into this very strong analytical personality type. And so I was like, aha, the light bulb went off. He doesn't wanna make a decision right then because he wants more data. So it took a little bit more work on my part, but I started going to him a week before the department meeting and saying, Here's, here's something that I'd like us to be able to make a decision on next week at the meeting. Here's the data that I, that I have. You are so strong with data. You're so good with data. Could you please look at what I have? Tell me if you see there's gaps in what we need so that we can make a decision next week. Now, what have I done? I've engaged him as an analytical. I've respected his his ability to look at data. I've asked him to help me. Now he doesn't feel railroaded by the driver in the meeting. And there would be times when he would say, I think we should, can, I think we should have this piece of data. You know what? He was right. That's really good data to have. And so recognizing what somebody brings can actually help you as a leader, be a better leader and make better decisions. Now, this person, personality style. These are the amiables. And the amiables are people people. They want to make sure that others are included and feel good about the process. They're excellent, coordinator, excellent coordinators because they take the time to check that all are involved. What's the negatives? They can be perceived as unsure and conforming. Drivers and analyticals don't always appreciate the value of the amiables on the team. The amiables are critical because there's one thing I have learned um, is that teams work best when people, people have to feel comfortable. There has to be psychological safety on a team in order for people to feel free to speak up and challenge an assumption or challenge a decision. And amiables are critical to people feeling comfortable. Now, this is the last uh, personality style, okay? And I love this Steve Jobs quote, stay hungry, stay foolish. If that just doesn't get your expressive juices flowing, I don't know what will. Stay hungry, stay foolish. So these are the expressives. Expressives are big picture people. They're future oriented. They're intuitive and they're creative. What's their negative? They can be seen as undisciplined, egotistical, or excitable. Expressives want to go to the future and they get all pumped up about this, this new device or new solution that's gonna bring a huge benefit. But they may not want to get down and do the work, okay? So that is, is one per possible perception of very strong expressives, is that they're there to help you create the plan but they don't actually get excited about 
doing the work to achieve the plan. Now, as I said, all of us have, almost all of us have elements of each of these four personality styles, although some of us are more dominant in one or two than others. So, so as a leader of your team, how are you going to get the most out of each team member? With drivers, you're going to be brief and to the point, okay? Erica, and I, I'm, I'm a fairly strong driver. I don't need to, I don't actually need to know how your weekend was. I don't need to know about the kids. Now, do I love you? Does your family matter to me? Of course it does. You're my partner. You're my colleague. But when you come to me, do I need the kind of the, so, does a driver need that level of social interaction? No. Drivers want you to be brief and to the point. When you see a document and you see the executive summary at the beginning of the document, who is that for? You're right. That's for the drivers. And when that same document has an appendix that has all the data, what's the, who's the appendix for? The analyticals. Okay? So when you structure, you, you can think of people understand this. People understand that certain personality styles need different information. And you can tailor, again, tailor your communication to the personality style of your team member. All right, what about analyticals? Just as I told you, shared with you that experience I had with my partner who is such a strong analytical, allow more time for the data. Amiables, remember the relationship. Show them how others will be helped. If you want to engage them, right, tell them about how this project is really going to benefit patients or benefit the team or the company. What, what is, how are others going to be helped? And the expressives, keep your eye on the big picture. Ask them for ideas. That's how you're going to get the most out of each team member. So high performance teams, they're inclusive and respectful of all four work types. They constantly check in with each other. They're open to and welcome feedback. And of course, I'm giving you like hours of, of, hours of, of talks about high performance teams condensed into these few slides, but these are very key elements. And they live by this motto. I've learned this from Dr. Robbins. Who's responsible for what? By when? And how do we check in with each other to make sure we're on track? It is so common for teams to not live by this motto. Often, you'll end a meeting and people will be assigned responsibility for certain action items. That's fairly common. But People don't often put a timetable on it. Why? Because that requires more thought, more commitment. And people don't figure out how they're going to check in with each other if they're not on track. So if, we really, if you really want to advance your team to high performance, then incorporate this discipline into your team meetings. Who's going to do what? By when? And how are we going to check in with each other to make sure we're on track? Now, I want to, to talk about how great teams combat unconscious bias, right? You, we talked about unconscious bias in the male-dominated engineering teams that created the first generation airbag. It's important for us to understand that our social behavior is not completely under our conscious control, but it is driven by learned stereotypes that operate automatically when we interact with other people. We meet somebody and we have an impression of them just by the way that they look, just by who they are. First impressions. First impressions happen within seconds of us meeting someone and results in us putting that individual in a certain category. Warmth and competence are two critical variables in terms of how we view people. This is the work of Amy Cuddy, who's at Harvard now. And I think this is fascinating work and, it, and um, easy for us to understand. So if we, we look at warmth and competent, right? And we all want others to see us as warm as comp and competent. Why? Because they, they admire us and they wanna help us and they wanna cooperate with us. Now let's go to the cold and incompetent category. If we see someone as cold as incompetent, well, we don't like them. We ignore them. Sometimes we harass, people will harass them. Okay. Let's go 
to the warm and incompetent category, okay? This is somebody who's, who's nice and sweet, but you know, they're not really doing their job well. So how do we respond to them? We could pity them, or we help them, or we ignore them. Now, this is a real issue for teams, and I'll give you an example. We had a secretary in our department who was warm and incompetent. And my partners who had her as their secretary would constantly come to me complaining about her incompetence. And I said, okay, I need data. I need examples. We'll create a performance improvement plan. This is a big organization. We'll find another place for her to go. Our work, our department's high volume, high stress. She's just not a good fit for us, right? I don't want to get her fired. I just want to get her moved. I want her, I want her to not be on our team. And for three months, they, I asked for this, and they would not do it. Finally, I met with them and I said, listen, you, you're not stepping up. So, so that means you're just, you're going to have to tolerate her. I did have one weak moment when I thought maybe I should take her as my secretary, but then my husband promptly talked me out of that. He said, I, can, I just won't be able to handle you if you have to, because she was just so, so ineffective. So I said, you, you, need to, you need to show me examples or I can't do anything. And the reason why they struggled was because she was so nice, but she's just so nice, Mary. And I'm like, okay, then you have to put up with her incompetence. So let's go to the, actually the most interesting category here, cold but competent. So this is the category where our behavior is ambivalent because we both respect them and somehow we resent them a little bit. We know they're competent, so we respect their competence, but we're uncomfortable because we see them as cold. I'm pausing because what I want you to appreciate is that women and non-white male leaders, we put all, all of these people in this category of cold but competent. And we're ambivalent to them. We're not sure how we should react. And I put this picture of Hillary Clinton up, be, not to represent any type of partisan uh, approach, but to say, People perceive women leaders and non-white male leaders, okay, although this is, this is strongest for women, as cold, because, because how could Hillary Clinton be nice? If I put a picture of Bill Clinton up next to her, right, you would say, Bill Clinton's smart, and he's warm. We have a perception of him as warm, but we see Hillary as not warm, and this is because we internally, unconsciously, subconsciously see women as warm and nurturing because our mothers are women and they were warm and nurturing. And then when we see women as leaders, we have this, this conflict because, I mean, how could that woman get to the top? Because if you're going to rise and be a leader, don't you have to be kind of ruthless? And don't you have to make difficult decisions? And don't you have to not be nice? And that comes into conflict with women as warm and nurturing. So we see women leaders as cold. And that affects the ability of women to break the glass ceiling. And it affects our ability to have high performance teams. Because I'm going to go back to the airbag example. If there had been women engineers on that team, I know in my heart of hearts that we would not have seen the tragedy of women, children, and small men being killed by first generation airbags. So we need to recognize that we have this unconscious bias towards women, white women, black women, Latinas, okay, and, and, and work to overcome that. We're gonna do a couple fun fact or fiction uh, examples. Boys, and this is right up your, your alley as engineers, Boys are better at math, so it's only natural they'd be the scientists, physician, I should add engineers, and medical researchers. What's the fact? Girls now outperform math on standardized math tests. How about that? But who's this guy? 
All right, again, we're not live, so I can't, I can't poll you, but this is Larry Summers. He was the president of Harvard. And back in 2005, he was reportedly, reported by the Boston Globe as having shared with the Harvard trustees when they asked him, why is there not more gender diversity on the Harvard faculty? He said, well, the male domi dominated science faculty at Harvard might be skewed by a biological factor. Whoa, okay. Because, now this is my part, the first bullet point is that's what he was reported in the Boston Globe as saying. I would say, okay, so maybe Larry Summers is thinking that Harvard needs the skills and traits found in the top 0.01% of the population, right? Because after all, it's Harvard and, you know, they want to be the best. And these traits are more likely in men. And so that's why there's more male scientists at Harvard. I am creating the explanation for his biological factor. So let's look at the top 0.01% in math. In the early 1980s, that was 13 boys to one girl. In 1991, that disparity lessened, four boys to one girl. No change since then, at least for this publication in 2010. So, so what does that tell us? It tells us that there are sex differences or maybe some gender influence there, but there are, we can, we can make a conclusion that we believe that there are sex differences in abilities at the extreme right tail, right? I mean, boy, girl, boy brains are different than girl brains. Every cell has a sex, every person has a gender. Maybe boy brains are more likely to be able to do math in that top 0.01%. So maybe, does that mean gender bias is okay? Don't we want the best and the brightest? And shouldn't Harvard be proportional to the gender composition at the top 0.01%? Then we'd have really smart people, great research and treatments, and what could go wrong? Again, I'm coming back to this is what goes wrong when we don't have diversity on our teams. So I'm going to conclude with another example of differences between genders. And this is where you're supposed to laugh, okay? And that's because, right, women see themselves, may look in the mirror and see themselves as heavier, and men look in the mirror and they see themselves perhaps in a different way. But there's also similarities between genders. When a girl says she'll be ready in five minutes, she's using the same time scale a guy is when he says the game has five minutes left. So. I'll conclude with that. Again, the, oh, this is a picture of my um, collegiate championship rowing team at Yale and uh, my email address. And I would love to hear your thoughts on the presentation. And I look forward to the panel discussion. So thank you very much.